interpreter as una herida abierta, is an open wound, where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. And before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. This is a wonderfully evocative passage for many reasons, not least for the way it suggests that when cultures come together, the result can be violent and bloody. In this lecture, I want to use Anzaldúa's words to introduce the subject of Latino mystery and suspense fiction. Latino writers add an interesting dimension to the genre by exploring how marginal communities often have to police themselves. In addition, by virtue of the fact that these writers often use border settings, they make the genre's use of setting considerably more complex. Finally, these writers often explore social justice issues in their work, which gives their detectives an explicitly political dimension not often seen in mainstream examples of the genre. In doing so, these writers explore the genre's potential to change as well as reflect society. With Anzaldúa's words in mind, we'll look at how Latino mystery and suspense fiction gives us an opportunity to see what happens when cultures come into contact and bleed into each other. According to the critic Ralph Rodriguez in his seminal book, Brown Gumshoes, the roots of Latino crime fiction can be found in the work of Rolando Inoyosa. Born in the lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas in 1929, Hinoyosa came from a family with strong Mexican and American roots. His first novel, The Valley, was published in 1973. This four-part novel consists of loosely connected sketches, narratives, monologues, and dialogues, offering a composite picture of Chicano life in the fictitious Belkin County town of Clayle City, Texas. The Valley is characteristic of much of Hinoyosa's subsequent work in at least two ways. First, in its combination of genres and its large cast of characters. And second, in its focus on the fictional locale of Clayle City. In fact, Hinoyosa has described much of his work as consisting of pieces of one large project known as the Clayle City Death Trip, a project whose aim has been described by Hinoyosa in the following words. My goal is to set down in fiction the history of the lower Rio Grande Valley. A German scholar, Wolfgang Carrer, from Osnabrück University, has a census of my characters. They number some 1,000. That makes me an Abraham of some sort. Most of the other entries in the Cleo City Death Trip series, including Korean Love Songs and Fair Gentlemen of Belkin County, are also experimental and mixed genres, and they usually follow the lives of the same large and eclectic group of characters. For these reasons, there was some consternation among Hinoyosa's readers when he seemingly interrupted his usual pattern in the series in 1985 by writing a conventional novel, namely a crime novel entitled Partners in Crime, which Ralph Rodriguez has described as the first Latino detective novel. Partners in Crime tells the story of the murder of a Belkin County district attorney and several Mexican nationals in a local bar. Detective squads from both sides of the border, including Hinoyosa's main detective, Rafe Buenrostro of the Belkin County Homicide Squad, are called in to investigate the case. And the investigation subsequently leads to the discovery of an established and powerful cross-border cocaine smuggling ring. Although some of Hinoyosa's readers were concerned that partners would disrupt the pattern of the Clayle City Death Trip series, Hinoyosa himself clearly did not think so. Instead, I would say that he saw the potential of the mystery and suspense fiction genre to explore the issues with which the series as a whole is concerned 
but from a different angle. To be precise, crime and its investigation gave Hinayosa a way to both explore fault lines within this close-knit community and use the border setting as a way to dramatize the consequences of those fault lines. With that said, this turn toward the crime genre turned out to be temporary for Hinayosa. So far, he's written only one other crime novel, Ask a Policeman, in which he again draws on the border setting to dramatize the complexities of the drug trade and who profits from that trade. Rafe Buenrostro has to investigate a series of murders that seem to suggest that a drug cartel is being torn apart by an internal war. Rafe's investigation takes him not only to seedy locales on the southern side of the border, but also to prosperous suburban residences on the northern side. In this way, Hinayosa shows how the poorest border region can make it challenging to draw a clear line between good and evil, right or wrong. While Hinayosa's two mystery novels are well-plotted and compelling police procedurals, it would obviously be a stretch to define him as a crime novelist per se. I mean this not as a criticism of Hinayosa, but more as a reflection of the fact that for many Latino writers, mystery and suspense fiction is just one among many genres they can use to address the concerns that characterize their work as a whole. The same could be said of Alicia Gaspar de Alba, who is known primarily as a scholar of Chicano art, culture, and sexuality, but who is also a novelist. She's the author of a single crime novel, Desert Blood, which was published in 2005. This is an extremely significant novel, however, not least because it addresses a major example of real-world violence that has blighted the border between Mexico and the United States in recent years. I'm referring to the murder of hundreds of women and girls in Ciudad Juarez, a border city on the Rio Grande that lies south of the U.S. city of El Paso. It's estimated that since 1993, when the murders are assumed to have begun, many hundreds of female victims have met their deaths due to a variety of causes, including robbery, gang wars, drug trafficking, and sexual assaults. The crimes have resulted in international attention, not only because of the large number of victims involved, but also because of claims of government inaction in relation to finding the perpetrators and discouraging violence against women. Gaspar de Alba's novel, Desert Blood, can therefore be read as a kind of intervention into and commentary on the Ciudad Juarez murders. The novel tells the story of Yvonne Villa, a women's studies professor who travels to her hometown of El Paso to arrange for an adoption for herself and her female lover. However, the pregnant Juarez factory worker who agreed to give up her baby becomes the latest victim in a long string of unsolved murders of Mexican women in the area. Appalled by these events, Via vows to find out who killed this woman, but a variety of personal and political pressures all make it difficult for Via to find out the truth. The novel is unflinching in its depiction of violence and its recreation of the difficult lives of the poor and vulnerable in the contemporary U.S.-Mexico border region. This makes Desert Blood a great example of a Latino mystery novel that strives to make a contribution to social justice by addressing a real-world issue in the form of a crime novel. It's possible to get another angle on Gaspar de Alba's achievement in Desert Blood thanks to the fact that she has also edited an anthology of essays on the Ciudad Juarez murders entitled Making a Killing. Femicide, Free Trade, and La Frontera, published by the University of Texas Press in 2010. This anthology, the first of its kind, uses a variety of perspectives, including feminism, Marxism, 
semiotics and textual analysis to examine the meaning of the murders from every conceivable angle. If you combine this anthology with Desert Blood, you have a perfect example of my earlier point, that some Latino writers use a variety of genres to examine concerns that range across their work. One final example of this phenomenon can be found in the work of Rudolfo Anaya, who was born in 1937 in the village of Pastura, New Mexico. Thanks mainly to his extremely influential 1972 novel, Bless Me Ultima, Anaya is considered to be a major figure in Chicano literature. Bless Me Ultima is set in rural New Mexico in the 1940s. Its protagonist, Antonio Mares y Luna, is a young man whose passage into adulthood is being supervised by the eponymous Ultima. Bless Me has become extremely influential for the way it captures the importance of indigenous customs and traditions, and the way in which those traditions may act as a form of protection against the negative aspects of modernity. Variations of these concerns animate the vast majority of Anaya's other work, including a quartet of crime novels featuring private investigator Sonny Backer. The series begins with Zia Summer, which was published in 1995, and continues with Rio Grande Fall in 1996, Shaman Winter in 1999, and, after a gap of some years, Hemes Spring, which was published in 2005. The series contains several elements that make it unusual in comparison to the vast majority of other mystery and suspense fiction narratives. Zia Summer is typical of the series as a whole in that it appears at first glance to be written in a recognizably hard-boiled style. Sonny Backer has just begun his career as a small-time private investigator in Albuquerque, New Mexico, when he's called upon to investigate the death of his cousin, Gloria Dominic, whose body has been found drained of its blood and with a strange sign etched around her navel, the ancient Zia sun symbol. At first, the solution to the mystery seems to be connected with money, greed, and political corruption. In other words, with the motives we normally associate with hard-boiled crime fiction. Confirming this emphasis on the themes of greed and corruption are passages such as this one, in which Sonny comments on the limitations of contemporary materialism. The beautiful people of Hollywood, television, movies, caricatures, surrounding themselves with luxury, coated with a gold sheen but empty inside. Even here in the North Valley, we have those who cover themselves with the sheen of gold. All over the city, we have the hombres dorados, men of empty promises. As the novel progresses, however, it goes in a very different direction, and one that a first-time reader of Anaya will likely be quite surprised by. The struggle turns out not to be between the usual suspects, that is, between the private eye and the criminal. Instead, Anaya uses these two character types to stage an increasingly metaphysical, even supernatural struggle between the forces of darkness and light, good and evil. To bring us back down to earth for a moment, the villain in Zia Summer turns out to be Antony Pajaro, also known as Raven, who will become the antagonist in all four novels in the series. It turns out that Raven and fellow members of his Zia cult killed Gloria when she found out that the cult was organized not only around spiritual beliefs, but also around plans to destroy the world by using nuclear weapons in order to bring about what Raven calls the New World Order. At this point, Anaya's first-time reader could be forgiven for thinking that we've traveled very far from the standard definition of mystery fiction not least because the introduction of apparently supernatural elements seems to fly in the face of much common sense thinking about the genre. 
That common sense dictates that mystery and suspense fiction is, above all, the genre where either ratiocination or the real world reigns supreme, which means that supernatural elements are either implicitly or even explicitly banned. Well, of course, we've traveled a long way from standard conceptions of the genre. That's the point. In his work, Anaya uses what we might describe as the underlying moral architecture of the genre, which I think can be accurately described as dramatizing the struggle of good against evil and brings it into the foreground. With that said, it's important to mention that Anaya never departs from geopolitical reality entirely. Hemes Spring, for example, the explosive final entry in the quartet, revolves around the fact that someone has planted a bomb not far from the Los Alamos National Laboratories in New Mexico, and it's set to detonate in just a few hours. Anaya generates suspense by considering a range of possible suspects, including environmental activists, terrorists, crooked politicians, as well as his old nemesis, Raven. In other words, Anaya combines elements of the real and the spiritual in what I'm tempted to call magical realist mystery fiction. But why bother? Why bring this combination of elements together in the first place? Well, remember the overarching theme of Anaya's 1972 novel, Bless Me Ultima. Just as in that earlier novel, Anaya focuses on the power and significance of indigenous traditions and customs as a way to resist the negative aspects of modernity, in his Sonny Backer quartet of crime novels, Anaya is ultimately making the very same point. From an early stage of the series, Sonny realizes that if he's going to win his protracted battle against Raven, he'll need to draw just as much on skills and powers associated with the curanderas, or traditional healers, as he will any skills associated with private eyes. What we see in Anaya's work, therefore, is a blended form of mystery and suspense fiction that allows him to address a wide range of issues, including issues that the vast majority of mystery narratives don't consider. Up to this point, we've mostly discussed the work of Latino writers who write mystery and suspense fiction and a number of other genres. In turning now to the work of Lucha Corpi, we'll examine a writer who has devoted the greater part of her career to writing mystery narratives. Corpi was born in Veracruz, Mexico, and moved to the U.S. with her husband when she was 19 so that he could study at UC Berkeley. After they divorced, Corpi herself studied at Berkeley and received a degree in comparative literature. For the first part of her career, she was known primarily as a poet. She published her first non-mystery novel, Delia's Song, in 1989, and then turned her attention to mystery writing in 1992, when she published Eulogy for a Brown Angel, featuring a protagonist by the name of Gloria Damasco, who would go on to become her series character. Damasco is also featured in a number of other mystery novels, including Cactus Blood, Black Widow's Wardrobe, Crimson Moon, in which Damasco shares the stage with Justin Escobar, her business partner and later husband, and Death at Solstice, which was published in 2009. It's worth emphasizing the importance of the fact that Corpi's primary protagonist is not only female, but also identifies as a Chicana feminist, and is someone with a long history of political activism. This indicates not only Corpi's insistence on integrating analyses of real-world political issues and events into her mystery fiction, but also her emphasis on the importance of confronting machismo, that ingrained set of beliefs about male superiority and female inferiority that, at least from Corpi's perspective, is still very much a feature of Latino culture. You might expect that, given this aggressive insistence upon the materiality of the real world in Corpi's work, 
we find none of the emphasis on the spiritual and the supernatural that we saw in Rodolfo Anaya's work. But that's not quite the case. In fact, those elements are present, but they just aren't as dominant as they are in Anaya. For example, in several novels in the series, Corpi discusses what amounts to a sense of extrasensory perception in Damasco. Her dreams frequently take on the quality of visions in that some parts of them seem to predict the future. And she sometimes knows what steps to take next in an investigation more from an intuitive hunch than from knowing exactly what's happening and why. As you can imagine, some critics have suggested that these elements in Corpi's work can help her close up the holes opened up by sloppy plotting. I think that's a little unfair. It would be more accurate to say that Corpi is just as interested in Latino folklore and culture, which includes tales of saints, mystics, and miracles, as she is in Latino history and politics in the narrow sense. Although to a lesser degree than in Anaya, Corpi's work is also animated by an intriguing combination of traditional detective work and the exploration of what we might call non-traditional ways of knowing. But I definitely don't want to give the impression that Latino history and politics take a back seat to mysticism in Corpi's work. Her debut novel, Eulogy for a Brown Angel, for example, takes place against the background of the height of the Chicano civil rights movement in the 1960s and 1970s. Even though at this stage of her life, Gloria Damasco is a full-time political activist rather than a trained private eye, when a murdered child is found dead on the street, Damasco is still determined to unravel the mystery and see justice done. This suggests that, if anything, for Corpi and Damasco, an interest in politics is primary because it's that interest that leads to an associated concern with social justice and solving mysteries. In a similar vein, Cactus Blood involves Damasco's investigation of a case where all the victims used to be associated with Cesar Chavez's United Farm Workers Movement, and in particular, that organization's 1973 Great Strike. With that in mind, one of the most intriguing clues Damasco finds is a bunch of grapes inside the fridge of her murdered friend, Sonny Mares. Sonny has honored every single call for a grape boycott from Cesar Chavez. So what would he be doing with the grapes? And finally, in Death at Solstice, Corpi's most mystically infused Gloria Damasco mystery, Damasco is once again being troubled by persistent dreams and visions, this time involving a ghost horse and a woman's voice pleading for help. Once she becomes involved in a case in California's wine country, these visions seem to take on material form, which not only confirms Damasco's gift, but also allows Corpi to explore the deadly serious subject of human trafficking and forced labor. Once again, we are seeing the seamless way in which Latino writers turn to the mystery to explore both cultural and political issues. My final example of the way in which Latino mystery and suspense fiction blends politics, settings, history, and culture with the defining elements of the genre is a book that I regard as nothing less than a masterpiece, The Tattooed Soldier, a novel published by Hector Tobar in 1998. Tobar was born in 1963 in Los Angeles and is the son of Guatemalan immigrants. Known primarily as a journalist, he was part of the Pulitzer Prize winning team at the Los Angeles Times for his coverage of the 1992 LA riots. Tobar draws on various elements of his personal and professional background in The Tattooed Soldier, his first novel. The novel is set in both the poorest neighborhoods of Los Angeles in the weeks before the 1992 riots and in the Guatemala of the late 1970s and early 1980s, when the country was being torn apart 
by a brutal civil war that would eventually claim hundreds of thousands of lives. The novel moves back and forth between these two settings and includes several major characters. The first of those characters is Antonio Bernal, who was forced to flee Guatemala and move to Los Angeles after his wife and daughter were killed by a death squad in retaliation for writing a letter complaining about the quality of the drinking water in their slum neighborhood. The second major character is Guillermo Longoria, the tattooed soldier of the title and also the leader of the death squad that killed Bernal's family. Longoria has also been forced to move to Los Angeles, but in his case, it's to avoid arrest for his heinous crimes. Having recently been made homeless, Bernal is wandering the streets of his neighborhood one day when by chance he bumps into Longoria. Bernal recognizes him instantly thanks to the tattoo of a jaguar on his arm, but Longoria doesn't recognize him. Understandably, Bernal quickly becomes obsessed with avenging his family by killing Longoria, and much of the suspense of the novel is generated by Bernal's slow and systematic stalking of his prey. The genius of Tobar's novel, however, is that the revenge narrative is only one part, albeit a major part, of the narrative. The fact that Bernal's attack on Longoria takes place against the background of the LA riots invites the reader to consider the relationship between an individual act of violence and violence on a much larger scale. Similarly, the information that Tobar provides about the Guatemalan Civil War, the United States' role in that war, and forms of slow systemic violence such as pollution and poverty, all combine to make The Tattooed Soldier an incredibly sophisticated and complex novel that forces the reader to think in new ways about definitions of crime, violence, and justice. Critic Ralph Rodriguez has commented on the way in which the detective novel has played a crucial role in Latino self-definition and has allowed writers to discuss a wide range of issues, including religion, culture, politics, the nation, and family. We can see the accuracy of Rodriguez's comments if we look back over the writers we've discussed in this lecture. Beginning with Rolando Hinojosa's Cleo City books and moving through the work of Alicia Gaspar de Alba, Rudolfo Anaya, Lucha Corpi, and culminating in the work of Hector Tobar, we've seen evidence of the rich and diverse contributions that Latino writers have made to mystery and suspense fiction. The fact that so many authors turn to a single genre to address such a wide range of issues is more evidence of the extraordinary flexibility and innovativeness of mystery narratives.